So we want to, uh, to dig into God's Word for a few minutes here. Uh, let me read from Ephesians chapter 1. I have not stopped giving thanks to God for you. I remember you in my prayers and ask the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, to give you the Spirit who will make you wise and reveal God to you so that you will know him. I ask that your minds be open to see his light so that you will know what is the hope to which he has called you. How rich are the wonderful blessings he promises his people and how very great is his power at work in us who believe. This power working in us is the same as the mighty strength he used when he raised Christ from death and seated him at the right side in the heavenly world. Christ rules there above all heavenly rulers, above all authorities and powers and lords. He has the title superior to all titles of authority in this world and in the next. That phrase, the power working in us, is the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. And in another translation, it says the immeasurable strength. This great and mighty power that God exhibited, that God used to raise Jesus from the dead, is alive in you. Do you believe that? Now, in the first century, and in Israel in the first century, many of the religious leaders did not believe that uh, resurrection could be possible. They didn't believe in a resurrection. They didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in spirits. Now, this was the group that is known as the Sadducees. Now, if, if you're familiar with that history, there were the Pharisees who were religious leaders. There was the Sadducees, and there was the, the priests. And most of the priests and the high priests were Sadducees. So think about this. The Pharisees, who we've talked about lots, the Pharisees believed in angels and in spirits and in resurrection. But the Sadducees, which include, included most of the priests, did not believe in any of that. And so as we see through a lot of the book of Acts, and, and, and in Acts um, chapter 23 specifically, uh, Paul is defending himself on trial. And, and, and the Sanhedrin would be the court of 70 people made up of Pharisees and Sadducees and high priests. And all the way through the book of Acts, we see the same thing. As, as they stand trial, their argument is defending the resurrection. Defending the fact that Jesus actually came back to life. And in Acts chapter 23, as Paul is doing that, um, a room full of priests and Sadducees, He's saying, the reason I'm standing trial today is because I believe in the resurrection. So, so many times in the book of Acts, their sermons and defenses were about proving the re resurrection. This was one of the biggest points of contention through the New Testament. That, is there a resurrection? Did Jesus come back to life or not? And, and people, more and more and more, were believing that Jesus came back to life. They were, they were knowing firsthand this power that was transforming lives. The hope was building. The power was moving. Lives were changed. Brokenness was restored. As was prophesied in the Old Testament, captives were set free. People in bondage whether that was because they were slaves or whether that was addictions. We all know things in our lives that hold us bondage and keep us captive. They were being set free. And people were healed and brokenness restored. And Paul brings this through a lot of his teaching. If Jesus was raised from the grave, then these religious leaders and many of the priests and high priests, it meant that they 
actually put the Messiah to death. Can you imagine the weight of that on them? Not, ju- not to mention that, that they didn't want this to happen because the Pharisees had fought so hard just to get rid of Jesus because the, the trouble he was causing and, and turning their world that they had crafted upside down. But the high priests, they did not want this resurrection to be happening. To have heard of that means that everything that their tradition believed, everything, all of their convictions to the core of who they were, were wrong. You see this tension? If Jesus was raised from the dead, then Jesus was who he claimed to be. If Jesus was raised from the dead, then the cross itself becomes huge in history. And, and, and all of the events on Good Friday surrounding the cross become huge on Good Friday. Think of uh, at the moment Jesus died when the, the curtain in the temple ripped in two. Well, that curtain was what separated people from the presence of God. And as that ripped in two, do you see what that meant? That meant the moment Jesus died, people had access to God, to the presence of God. He was not distant. He was not separated. It's wide open that we could go and walk and stand, as the New Testament says, right in the presence of God because of what Jesus did. If Jesus was raised from the dead, then death is not the end. And life, Life has more meaning than life itself. And if Jesus is raised from the dead, then hope has a whole new foundation. That we could live in hope. Were you here on Friday? On Friday we looked at what happened on the cross. And on Friday, there's a couple of things we talked about, the three word pictures we see in the Bible about Jesus on the cross and what he accomplished. One was the Passover lamb. We talked about that for a little bit and said, if, if we know the Jewish history, we know as they were in Egypt in slavery, that, that they were asked to, kill, to sacrifice a lamb and put the blood on the doorposts, and as the angel of death came, he would pass over their house because of the blood of that lamb. And they were set free from their bondage. Free to live and to worship God. And the second picture was uh, a ransom. The actual ransom paid for a slave. And we haven't been slaves. But we know that even in our North American history. That the price paid, the ransom paid to set somebody free. That's a picture of Jesus on the cross in our New Testament. And the third one was in their justice system. That when they were out of line, when they broke the law, when they broke God's law, they were required to bring an animal, a perfect animal, sacrifice it uh, as the payment, the justice payment. We talked about that on Friday, but I want to say clearly that Friday, what happened on Friday, Jesus on the cross, was nothing and meant nothing if it wasn't for Sunday. Do you believe that? The cross is meaningless unless Jesus rose from the dead. So are we saved because of Jesus' death or because of his resurrection? Would salvation itself exist without the resurrection of Jesus? In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul writing to this church says, that there is no atonement without the resurrection. If you have a Bible, turn there. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This whole chapter is about resurrection. And as he's writing to this church in Corinth, he's writing about Jesus' resurrection and talking about our resurrection in one day. And remember last week while you're turning there, uh, on Friday I talked about the word atonement. And it simply means at one meant. Where we were separated from God. And we were made one. It it was the cementing together, completely unified, at one. We are one with God because of this. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 
I won't read lots of it. I'll skip around a little bit. It says, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. That is what Paul's saying. Here's the first most important thing. If you miss everything else in this book, the most important thing is Jesus died for our sins, and that he was buried, and on the third day he rose. He continues on and says, And that he appeared to Cephas and to the twelve, and he appeared to more than 500 people at one time. And most of them are still alive, although some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles, and last of all, as one untimely born, he also appeared to me. That's Paul. And then to verse 12, Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there's no resurrection of the dead? So who's he speaking to here? This whole culture that did not believe it was possible. But if there's no resurrection of the dead, then, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. He has spent the whole second half of his life preaching. Jesus rose from the dead. There is hope. There is power in what Jesus did in the forgiveness of sin. All of that is a waste of breath if Jesus didn't come back to life. So if Jesus had not been raised, that's verse 14, then our preaching is in vain and our faith is in vain. What we trust, what we hold true, what we bank our lives on is completely in vain. Verse 15, if we are, and we are even found to be misrepresenting God. Here we are who claim to know God and to speak for God and to live for God. If Jesus is not raised from the dead, then we are misrepresenting God. Verse 16, for if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sin. So no matter what Jesus did on the cross on Friday, if he has not raised from the dead, we are still in our sin. Verse 18, and those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. So those people who are believers in Christ, those that have died and gone on, that's it. They're done. There's nothing else. Death is the end if Jesus didn't raise from the dead. And verse 19, if in Christ we have hope, even if it's only for this life, so even if, if, if we believe all this and we have hope in this, but he didn't raise from the dead, then it says, we of all people are most to be pitied. If Jesus did not raise from the dead. Skip down to um, verse 32. He says, I fought beasts in Ephesus. I don't know if you knew that or not. There's an amphitheater in Ephesus. Most of it is still standing. It holds about 30,000 people. Paul was dragged in there. As you've heard, Christians being thrown to the lions. Paul had been thrown in there and lived. And I think what he's saying here, if Jesus didn't raise from the dead, what gain is it if I was thrown to the lions and lived? And then he says, if the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. If Jesus didn't come back to life, then life itself is meaningless. On Friday, if you were here, we buried some stuff. We wrote some stuff on cards of things in our own lives that need to die and be gone. We gave them to Jesus and we buried them. We buried them and, and, and we put them in, in all these flower baskets that are around here. And as you can see, uh, there is new life there. 
It's, it's an example. It's a representation. Those things didn't actually grow into flowers, just in case anybody's wondering. Because God is in the business of breathing new life where, into where there is no life. God is in the business of taking bondage and captivity and addictions and behaviors and issues and struggles and attitudes that lock us up. He's taking what is broken and he makes it fresh and new and alive. That is his business. If Christ is raised from the dead, then look down to the end of that chapter almost, oh, not quite, that, that verse 54 and 55. If Christ was raised from the dead, then death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? Now think about a sting from an animal or from an insect. It's intended to to either kill or to wound. And that's exactly what that is. Death, where is that wounding? Where is that sting? Where is that hurt? Where is that 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 killing, where is that crippling sense of death? It's gone because it's been swallowed up in victory. It's been swallowed up in victory. On Friday, I said, all of the world's miseries can be captured in one word. It's death. All the sickness and pain, all the selfishness, all of the abuse, all of the brokenness and the heartache, and the fights are, are, are forms of death. There are forms of death. Every selfishness are forms of death. And when, when death, we naturally fight death, don't we? We naturally hate death. It hurts. Why is it that many of these other forms of death are things that we hold on to? Or we're unwilling to let go of? A writer named Trevin Max said this, Death is always our enemy. Watch someone die and you will know that something is wrong with our world. Death is never a friend. It's a curse on God's good creation. It mars the world with pain and suffering. Death is to be fought, not embraced. But Jesus didn't just defeat the power of sin to grip uh, and its grip on us. Jesus defeated death. Death had no hold on him, and because we are in Christ, death will have no hold on us. We are rescued from the clutches of this enemy, and we are promised eternal life. Death was swallowed up in victory. Death, where is your sting? Ephesians chapter 2, this passage that I was reading earlier, Ephesians chapter 2, Paul is talking about this same thing. This is a letter, that was a letter to the Corinth, this is a letter to the church in Ephesus. And and, and here's what he writes in in chapter 2, and you were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of this air, And the spirit that is now at work in the sons of the disobedience. That's where we were. Among whom we we all once lived in passions of our flesh. And carrying out the desires of our body and our mind. And we were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. In verse 4, two words. But God. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up. He raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places. If you went back to chapter 1, that passage that says, here's this great power that raised Jesus from the dead and is alive in us, said raised Jesus to sit in those heavenly places. And in chapter 2, that same power raises us to sit with him in those heavenly places. But God, 
when Jesus burst from the grave, a new power entered the world. Something the world didn't know before. And Paul says, uh, Paul goes on to say in, in chapter 1, verses 21 to 23, that this power will never be defeated. There is nothing like this. This is superior to anything and everything. And in 1 Peter chapter 1, Peter writes, God has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus. He's given us new life, a new regeneration, a brand new fresh start that now is wrapped up in hope. Is there anything that our world needs today more than hope? This is the promise of the resurrection. So here's what I see this morning. It's in this passage I read earlier in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17 to 19. He writes, I, do never, I don't cease to pray for you, remembering you in all my prayers that the, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation that you might know him that you would know him, and, and, and that when you know him, that there, you would know the hope to which he's called you, and, and the riches of the inheritance. And then he says what we talked about, and the immeasurable greatness of his power at work in us, that same power that raised Jesus from the dead. That same power that raised Jesus from the dead is alive in us. There's a power to transform lives that gives us hope in difficulty and in suffering and in loss. And what was dead is made alive. On Friday we buried some stuff as I said. God's plan isn't so much to reform us. Somebody came and told me this after Friday. God's plan is not so much to reform us. It is to regenerate us. Like a seed that has to be planted in the ground, that seed has to die. We know this, right? That seed has to die before the new life can sprout. What was dead, God breathes new life into. And in a way, that is what baptism is. Is Jesus, who is alive, who died who is buried, who rose again. That's baptism. It's that same action of dying to my old life. Dying to that, that life that Paul talked about there. Uh, and rising with Christ to new life. Regenerated. What is dead and gone is now new life in Christ. Have you ever seen a tree grow out of a dead stump? I'm sure we've all seen this somewhere. But that, in a sense, is a story we're going to hear this morning. I want to show a short video of Tasha. Uh, Tasha is getting baptized this morning. Let's hear a little bit of her story. Can you guys put that on now? Good morning, everyone. My name is Tasha, and I've decided to come to you from the big screen today because I think it's best for everyone. Some of you may know me from Pastor Dave's message on how God changes lives in 2018. If not, I attended my first service at Sabo Christian Fellowship Church last summer. I decided to come because it was on the beach and I wanted to make my dad happy. It was a beautiful day and there were so many people there. Andy didn't know I was coming that day, but I do believe I needed to hear what he had to say. I felt wanted, I felt happy, and the, the biggest feeling of all was want. I know that sounds bad, but I want to come back, I want to know more, and I want to hear more. I had always had my faith, but unfortunately I had a corrupt version of what a church should be. Therefore I never embraced it, until now. I started coming every Sunday, learning, listening, spending time with a beautiful Bible that Jenna gave me trying every day to use what I had read in my everyday life. But due to circumstances out of my control, my life was still a complete mess. Disagreements at work, 
Family conversations were strained. I felt sad and I felt alone. I decided I was unwanted by everyone. I took some pills and I know now that it was never enough to kill me, but I did get very sick. As I lay there wondering if I was going to die, I heard, you are not alone. I will always be there for you. Right then, I asked the Lord to please forgive me. Forgive me for everything that I had done to help me do what was right, no matter what the situation was. So what better way to show him that I'm all in, but to be baptized on what is a most perfect day. Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. To all of you that are here today, and to God as my witness, thank you for being here today. Tasha, did you know that the Latin meaning for your, wor for your name is the Lord's birthday? If I asked you when your birthday was, you may be able to tell me even down to the hour when you were born. But today we celebrate a much greater event in your life. Not the day that you were born into the world, but the day that Christ was born in you. For some, they know the exact time down to the hour. For others, this is maybe a period where God's at work in you as you see uh, him at work in your life and bringing you to a point where you surrender to God. By going through the waters of baptism, you're declaring to all of those around, I'm all in. Before, I used to live for myself, but now I live for Christ. The good news of the gospel is that whatever has happened between the day you were born and the day that you were reborn is forgiven and passed. As you move forward in knowing God, becoming like Jesus, and changing your world, never forget what God's word says about you. You are loved, you are wanted, you are uniquely created, you are forgiven. You are a child of God, and he takes delight in you. So I just want to pray for you before we baptize. God, I thank you for Tasha. God, I thank you for how you've been at work in her life. God, we look forward to seeing uh, this continued growth and this continued new life that you have given to her. And so, God, we just ask your blessing. God, we ask that uh, you would uh, just continue to guide and direct her. God, we thank you that your word says to ask and you will receive, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be opened. And God, you've done that uh, for Tasha. You were there uh, even in the lowest points of her life. And we thank you for that. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, Tasha, it's my pleasure today, because we've heard your testimony, and uh, you have confessed your faith in Jesus Christ, to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Oh, wasn't that great? Uh, on, and, and, and on Easter morning, how significant is that? If baptism is the action of dying to my old life, being buried and coming up to new life with Christ, uh, there's never a better time than Easter morning to celebrate that together. What was dead was made alive. Natasha literally rescued from death as God gave her life. And that's what we're celebrating today. The power that raised Jesus from the dead is alive in you. At creation, God breathed life into nothing. And from that point on, God was in the business of breathing life into that which was dead. But God. And in God's hands, we are alive. Does that mean that all our problems are gone? No, clearly not. But it does mean that where there was death, inside there is life. And I hope that that is your experience. That in the midst of suffering, in, in a world full of suffering and difficulties, there is life and there is hope and there is beauty as we are regenerated by Christ. And I don't know about you, but there's nothing I want more 
than to have my brokenness and death replaced with life and with hope. In Ezekiel chapter 37, the prophet Ezekiel says, The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley, and it was full of bones. And they led me around among them, and behold, there were many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord, only you know. And he said to me, Prophesy over these bones, and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the word of the Lord to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you will live. And I will lay sinews upon you. That's that's the, 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 the flesh, that, the tendons and ligaments that join muscles and bones. And God will put those on them, and they will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you, and you will live, and you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a sound, a, a, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to bone, and I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them. And flesh came on them, and skin covered them, and there was no breath in them. And he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, to say to the breath that the Lord God, uh, the Lord God says, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain so that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived, and they stood on their feet in an exceeding army. Behold, they say, our bones dried up, and our hope is lost, for indeed we are cut off. And God says, Behold, I will open your graves and remove you from your graves, O my people, and you will know that I am God. I will put my spirit within you, and you will live. Then you will know that I am the Lord. I have spoken. I will do it. What is it that you need God to breathe life into. On Friday, we said, what is it in you that we just need to bury? What needs to be gone? What do we need to give to God? Today, I'm asking, what do we need God to breathe new life into? This same power that raised Jesus from the dead, this same power that brought all those bones back to life, What does God want to revive in you? What does God want to breathe life in you into? And, and I think on your chair, you all had a colored piece of paper of some kind. In the chairs in front of you, there's, there's pens. And I'm going to ask you to take a second here, and I want you to write down on there. If you were here Friday, we did something very similar. Write down on there. Nobody else is in the room. It's just you. Write down on there what you want God to breathe life into. And as I thought about this, for me, I want God to breathe life into joy. Everything has become so serious, and I want to enjoy and live and love and and be full of joy. So I'm writing down joy. Take a second. And, 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 And... And for you, maybe it's something you need God's resurrection power to do, to be alive and to breathe life into. Maybe it's a story where God is doing that already for you and you want to write that down. But take a second and write that. What do we need God's defibrillator for? Because this power that raised Jesus from the dead is alive in you. And in a second, we're going to come up and there's five or six baskets across the front, and we're going to sing uh, a whole bunch more songs. And actually, you guys can come up and get ready. We're going to sing a whole bunch of songs to end our time together. And while we sing, will you come get out of your seat and go put it in one of those baskets? In a sense, let's bring it to the altar. Let's give it to God. And let's pray over these things. Very often I say, will you come back next week? Next week, we will have these uh, displayed with with all of the flowers. But next week, we are going to hear the stories of two or three people whose God's 
resurrection power is alive and well in them. And they're going to tell their stories about that. We're going to stop and pray together. And then we're going to take some time at the end of next week's service to pray about these things. Because what God wants is to see that new tree grow out of that dead stump. For his resurrection power to be alive and well. Ephesians chapter 1. What Paul wrote in his prayer, and we looked at this, I think, in January 13th. We spent a whole morning on that prayer. He says, I'm praying for you that you will know God and that you will know the hope to which he's called you. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, and all of us in this room uh, are coming from all kinds of different places, different places in life. Some are on the top of the world with everything's going fantastic. Others are in all kinds of pain and difficulty and sorrow and probably everywhere in between. But God, our prayer is this morning, as we think and celebrate, and we think about it and we celebrate Jesus bursting out of the grave, overcoming death, killing death off, taking away the grip of this that's on us and setting us free to live and to know God. God, would you stir in us a hope like we've never known? May we know firsthand, not just the hope, but the reality of the power alive in us, this magnificent, great power that raised Jesus from the dead that we would know that firsthand in our lives as we go from this place, as we live our lives. God, there's some here who are praying for healing for physical things. There's some here who are, are praying about emotional issues or marriages or finances or sin that's got us caught in our lives or joy. God, we bring these to you symbolically as we put them in baskets we bring them to your feet asking you to do exactly as you have promised to breathe life where there is death God as we worship you now we want to bring a smile to your face would you stir in our hearts open our eyes that we can see Jesus Amen